welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Merry Christmas, our readings for December 25th, 2023 are the familiar text. Our first reading is from Isaiah 62, verses 6 through 12. Our psalm is number 97. Our second reading is Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. And our gospel reading is Luke chapter 2. It's uh, verses 8 through 20, but uh, you can begin with verse 1, uh, depending on how you did uh, Sunday's uh, lesson uh, where we focused on uh, the first uh, 14 verses of chapter 2 of Luke. For our listeners, I will also let you know that if you're looking for um, the Nativity setting 3 and looking for the John reading, um, there is a rebroadcast of uh, one of our previous podcasts, but there are new commentaries. So uh, those of you who are looking for uh, the John text to read for Christmas, uh, there are new commentaries available and we point you in that direction. Um, and Caroline could have said something else, but... Uh, no, I think the decision not to have a new podcast was like, we really need to... <laughs> <laughs> really? What else does Caroline have to say? You know, so. but, but you always show us how much you have to say. But today we're going to talk about Luke. We are. And last week, or not last week, but yesterday, Christmas Eve, last night, uh, yeah, uh, we focused on, as you said, Joy, we focused on verses 1 through 14 and and then thought that we would focus on the latter verses here and eight through 20 and our tactic, if you will, our homiletical tactic for a holiday like this, like Christmas is where would we land in the passage? What, what is it that, what is it that strikes us? That is a, is something that takes us in a preaching direction or is particularly meaningful. And I, I'll, I'll go ahead and start and, I'm actually drawing on the commentary from Christmas Eve by Timothy Atkin Jones, and where he was talking about the the manger and what the the possibilities of the manger and and what that what that might mean, uh, what that might mean literally, but then also what that means symbolically. And my the question that kept coming up for me for this Christmas with 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 connection with that was this question, what place will there be for Jesus? Mm. What, where, when Jesus comes, what, what is going to be that place? Where, where are we going to put to Jesus? Where are we going to place Jesus? Um, are we, uh, and really kind of exploring that with imagination and metaphor like where do we keep jesus during the year <laughs> where do we where do we locate jesus where uh and where do we imagine jesus being in our lives so so that when we think about the meaning of the incarnation and the birth of jesus that we're going past this event but then where is it that, or maybe where's another question might be, where where will we keep Jesus now that Jesus is here in our lives and in uh in in the way we are in the world? So that's the question that that I what manger, you know, what manger will you place Jesus in? Or what, you know, like Timothy was talking about placing, you know, babies in drawers before there were cribs and you know, dresser drawers, but yeah, where will you keep Jesus now that Jesus is here? Mm -hmm. And and what difference does that make and what does that mean for you? Uh, so what are your what are your mangers right now? What is the manger that where you keep Jesus? That's my Christmas sermon. Ta da. Wow. Um, when you said you were reflecting on the commentary, uh, I did the same thing, but with the commentary from from this week that Raj has done. Um, and I was struck by uh, the um, contrast, um, and I think I've probably said this over these last few weeks all the way through Advent, of the con contrast of the hope amid uh, despair. And uh, his uh, highlighting 
that the shepherds are uh, prominent in Luke's uh, telling of the story and uh, that they received the good news as well. And uh, so uh, as you were speaking, because that was in my imagination, Caroline, I was thinking uh, not just where we were placing Jesus in terms of holding him in, but where are we placing Jesus in terms of out in the world? And the uh, intrusion, to keep using Matt's uh, word and idea, I've, I've always loved the idea of intruding God, uh, the intrusion is that in the midst of a context, a culture that cries peace, the angelic promise of peace goes to those least expected. And so telling that story of the shepherds showing up in this story can truly be good news for folks who need it most uh, right now. I'm going with the shepherds too. Hey, two for but one. A, the, but a slightly different angle on the shepherds. Uh, that line in verse 15, when the shepherds say, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place. They don't say, let's go see this baby that has been born. They say, let's go see this thing that has taken place. And in Greek there, it's the word is rhema, which means word, but not word as in logos, speaking of John 1. Uh, rhema, it's in a sense of a message, right? Let's see this message that has come about, or let's see this communication that has come into being. I might even stretch that a bit and say something like, let's see this story that's unfolding or something like that. That's that's a big translational stretch. But in other words, what they're curious about is not, let's see this baby and see if he's human like the rest of us or not, or let's go you know, worship this child. Let's see this thing that started. Um, let's see this event. Let's see this phenomenon, this manifestation, this, I mean, it's something I'm just, guessing with words here, but that's the response to Christmas. It's it's come let us adore him in some ways, but it's also this becoming part of this new movement that's it's it's coming into into place. Does that make sense? And so I would kind of play around with that as Christmas is a message more than it's a baby. It's obviously both, but you know, you got to put something on the marquee to make people come in sometimes. Um Anyway, I would just play around with that. Like, what's yeah. what's taking place here? What are we expecting to find when we get there? And it, it's it's a wonderful uh, setup for what's happening next. For you know, this isn't the end of the season. This isn't the end of the year. In fact, as we liturgically have noted, this is the beginning of uh, the year. We started with Advent, and now something has happened. A word has been offered, uh, and this intrusion of God uh, in the midst of the reality, um, wow, I love that. Uh, yeah, I think, I think our, our preachers can have a lot of fun with that one. Well, another thing that that does is carry it forward past Christmas, mm -hmm. you know, yes. that, which I think is always always a homiletical challenge, uh, particularly when you're getting the, you know, the Christmas Easter, the CNE people. And how is it that, not that your sermon has to convince people to come back, <laughs> but uh, but how how is that a, sort of a homiletical undercurrent in that communicating that this is not just a day, but this is a, this is a message, just as a proclamation that makes a difference for the world and, and the world in which you live and how to, how to carry that forward into the rest of Christmas, but then also epiphany. And it makes sense that epiphany follows, <laughs> follows Christmas, right? There's what, are, what are the ongoing manifestations of this Rima yeah. in the world? And I think with that too, you, you could do a lot of uh, really helpful connections using Isaiah and the Psalm and even Titus uh, to think about what is this, what is this rhema? What is this message that, that, that they are going to go and find? And, uh, and so with, you could do that. Yeah. You could do that with the Psalm. You could do with that Isaiah, you know, the light, see your salvation comes as his board is with him recompense. Uh, and so, yeah. And then the Titus of, of, I'm just trying to get to my 
got my papers here, the goodness and loving kindness of God, our savior appeared. Mm -hmm. So there are lots you could do with that too, making those connections. Yeah, Carolyn, I want to underscore and, uh, and, and maybe offer the challenge that uh, you call them EC Christians. I call them uh, et cetera, ECT, uh, uh, well, ETC. Uh, Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christian, Christmas, uh, the et cetera. Uh, and um, in some sense, knowing that you have people who may be coming just during this season or maybe once a year uh, to do what, and this, this takes your stretch of an interpretation, Matt, but to do that storying that is the reason that people stick with the Marvel Universe or the reason that folks read all of Harry Potter, or the reason that the wimpy kids are now being, you know, multiple. I just got introduced to the wimpy kid. I don't know, but there's a whole series. Um, but it's, it's, it's a reminder that the word we have, the message we have is indeed an ongoing dramatic act of God. And who are those that are watching and telling this story? And Maybe the homiletic mover challenge is indeed to have folks say, well, I wonder what the church back home is going to say after this. I would count that as a win. I'm not going to tell you what narratives or what, you know, series I stick with to the very end. I don't want, I don't want all of you to judge me, but <laughs> sometimes, you know, you think like, I don't really want to watch this anymore, but I've got so much invested in it. Um, <laughs> I like um, I, I like Michael Chan's commentary on Isaiah 62, which doesn't really immediately strike people. I think as a Christmassy kind of of prophecy, but this idea of a God who installs sentinels to continue to bother God, uh, it's like it's like when you set your alarm for like if you're taking a flight and you got to get up at 4 a.m. and you set your alarm for four, but then you set another one for 4:05 and 4:07 just in case, you know. Because you don't trust yourself. You could also ask Alexa to set an alarm too. So then you have your phone and Alexa. You could have all of your assistants, all your yeah. things. Alexa. Ooh. I was going to say, do you really want to keep calling her? Because soon <laughs> a bell's going to ring in 20 minutes. <laughs> soon she'll be able to do the podcast for us. We can just. No. <laughs> but, you know, and Michael goes on to talk about, you know, persistence and how this shouldn't make us think about a God who's forgetful or who's lazy, but it's a means of calling ourselves into that same impatient, persistent expectation. But then he also moves into the ways in which God's redemptive work is elusive. In some ways, it's almost kind of a trap. The, the passage is almost a trap saying, we need God to act, we need God to act, we need God to act. And then pulling us into that same kind of active waiting and that active yearning and longing and and the work that's involved there, God is actually then at work, right? God is actually then manifest in these hidden ways in our own advocacy, in our own work for justice, in our own outreach uh, and mercy. So I don't know what that means about Christmas necessarily, but I find that uh, some, there's some helpful imagery that might, um, in the hands of a better preacher than I, could really say something on Christmas. Yeah, I, and I also think that the uh, verse 11 is really an interesting tie in to some of the themes that we've already talked about. See your salvation comes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not has come. Um, that there's a forward movement of, of this event that, it, that God is unfolding and God is unfolding God's salvation in the world. And, um, and where, you know, where will we, uh, where will we not be silent in that? Uh, with that Isaiah gives witness all day and all night, they shall never be silent <laughs> about this uh, about this coming salvation. So that's I think a, a really a, could be a good connection as well. I will say if you um, did some focus on Christ the King uh, Sunday um, and wanted to um, echo that. Um, Joe Lamont's uh, commentary on um, Psalm 97 invites you to do that. Um, but particularly, I'm thinking of, Caroline, the, the nugget you gave us uh, yesterday 
uh, in terms of where you've placed Jesus. Um, and in the midst of uh, God's intrusion, where are we placing Jesus? And is Jesus on a throne? Is Jesus um, the one who is uh, ultimately um, the voice that we listen to, the path that we follow, the promise that we hold to? Um, and I and I think that uh, what uh, Joel does in the enthronement idea, but also ending that in terms of moving that to the nativity might be helpful, particularly if you focused on that and want to tie that together. Another great psalm that just gives you permission to sing a lot as well, if that's what you yeah. want to do on, on Christmas mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. But they did that yesterday. No. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying Christmas morning, no one's come to hear you preach a 20, 25 minute sermon. No. More, right? more then they, haven't they come to sing and more carols. To sing all those carols. Because the season it only gives us a couple of more uh weeks to do that. Well, and actually, you know, Psalm 97 could be a really in, uh I think could be a really meaningful entry into that singing mm -hmm. that you know you could even use psalm 97 at the very beginning of your christmas service and mm -hmm. say the lord is king let the earth rejoice and and rejoice. and say let us let us join in the earth's rejoicing and let it be you know that singing of of the praise of of god and what god has done in jesus so i think there could be a lovely invitation to that that communal rejoicing and that the entirety of the earth rejoices and we're, and, and we're a part of that as well. Uh, that, and, and recognizing again, going back to that, the salvation is for all and not just, not just people, but the redemption of the world, the redemption of the cosmos. And so it, it expands, once again, it expands the meaning of Christmas beyond, beyond our little walls in our church or our immediate communities, but the meaning of Christmas theologically, uh, and helping people think about, uh, think about what, what's at stake for God in 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 Christmas, and uh, and then then that also can be a forward movement toward what we will see in Epiphany. But this is what God has been doing to reconcile the world. Anything about Titus that we would want to point our working preachers? Yeah, well, it's it's the idea, you know, Jesus as a as a manifestation or an epiphany, which we'll talk about very soon as the next mm -hmm. season starts to dawn on us. But once again, it's it's not let's go see the child, let's go see this thing that's happened and hear what that thing is, or Titus doesn't say that, you know, what has appeared has been fully God human, fully human. Like in other words, Titus doesn't give us like a Chalcedonian formula for understanding who Jesus is or, or, you know, explaining the incarnation, but says the goodness and loving kindness of God, our savior has appeared. That's what's, that's what the message is, what the story is. And that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing. It's a fraught thing. It's a fragile thing. All that comes with being Born, all that comes with the incarnation and all of its weirdness. And I like what Jimmy Hoke says as well, that there's a way in which this opens us up to understand liturgy as being really inclusive and allowing a lot of space. That Christmas is not a time for doctrinal, insisting on doctrinal accuracy or something like that, right? But Christmas becomes an opportunity to sing all the difference, all the diversity of God's created goodness and all of what humanity brings to the table into that. So I think that's part of what happens when, <laughs> when these ragtag shepherds meet this ragtag couple and some ragtag place where Jesus is born. And it's all about the mercy and kindness of God, who's, a, who's reconciling the world to himself, a tie back to what you were saying, Caroline. This is, this is God's act. Um, it is God's mercy. Uh, and and I also appreciated the recognition that uh, 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 this allows for uh, a recognition of baptism uh, and and the other uh, works of the people. Um, but if we're going to do that, I would highly um, pay attention to the fact that this is about God's mercy and not about our works. That's what the text says. <laughs> yeah, and I I think yeah, going back to verse four. 
just to define or to think about Christmas as as the appearance or the manifestation or epiphany of God's goodness and loving kindness. Uh, that 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 goodness and loving kindness get defined by Christmas. And and so what difference will that mean in our our world to imagine how it's sort of a mutual definition of Christmas and goodness. And mm -hmm. how how does that help us see what goodness looks like, what kindness looks like, uh, and and uh, particularly as we imagine embodying this Christmas message in the world.